All right. Hi, Carmen. Welcome to the Radical Therapist Podcast. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. How exciting. I'm uh, excited to have you here. Uh, looking forward to talking about this topic. I've you know, been very quite curious about it for uh, a while now. And then to have somebody that's uh, a practicing narrative therapist and doing substance assisted therapy is just, uh, I just think it's a great opportunity for me as well as our listeners to kind of get a, a, a closer look at this kind of practice. And so mm-hmm. I guess my first question for you is how did you enter into the work of integrating plant medicines, et cetera, and other therapeutic substances in psychotherapy? Uh I guess it really started when uh, cannabis became legalized in BC. And I noticed that the people that I was working with were uh, feeling more open about talking about the ways that they're using substances in their lives. I uh, began exploring this idea of uh, self-medicating and um noticing that some people were actually very skillful at it Mm. and um, it always seemed to be a bit of a a no-no to bring that up with your therapist what's Mm. really going on and that it's you know instantly going to be framed as a substance use problem or misuse problem in some way which I guess didn't really fit with my own um, experience you know particularly having worked in the arts and creative context for a long time and seen lots of different ways that people engaged with substances and in positive and constructive ways that uh you know kind of really burst open the gates of creativity or connecting into flow state in ways that were actually supporting their practice so there's always this kind of uncomfortable tension there for me also and then as I started noticing um, psychedelic medicine gathering momentum, I thought, oh, great, this is, this is a thing. How am I going to, how am I going to integrate these things um, into my practice? So I really just started, I guess, creating space for people to be able to talk openly about what they were already doing. BC has a, a very uh, deep-rooted and broad uh connection with plant medicines, uh, with psilocybin in particular. And I guess I really just started approaching it from a harm minimization perspective. It's like, you're already doing this. You're already going off to the forest and having shrooms with your mates mm-hmm. and having transformative experiences. You know, Are you willing to share those with me? And then from there, thinking about, you know, what are those little shifts that we need to make to move from recreational to therapeutic use? What does that mean? What does that look like? How does this work? So, you know, I'm a couple of years uh, down that track now and I'm getting a little bit more of a sense of what that might look like for people. Wonderful. Um, I also have this uh, question about um, you come, you work from a narrative perspective and, Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering how, how have you found that narrative approach or narrative therapy useful in your work? Oh, all the good stuff, all the good stuff we know that um, helps people. The non-pathologizing approach um, is really significant and important in the way that I work with people, but also in that not imposing of our own frameworks or ideas in this realm. You know, in particular, when we're talking about all this lovely language that floats around, you know, the liminal spaces, the numinous, the ineffable, the you know, all the mystery that's contained in those realms. But, you know, what I am noticing as as the process has become more formalised and as more expertise is jumping into that realm, that the the lexicon's kind of shrinking a little bit. Everything's starting to sound the same. Even in integration circles, I'm noticing a kind of homogenizing of language a little bit, a kind of truncating of the experience like if nobody knows and nobody does Mm -hmm. your guess is as good as anybody's Mm -hmm. so I really enjoy being able to enter into that space of going I don't know what happened out there Mm -hmm. you you tell me how does that fit for what what frameworks what what do you bring to this conversation your understanding is really important your yeah have have a crack it's yeah. all it's all really beneficial right now, and to continue to encourage that uh, richness of language, 
to throw in some of the narrative jargon, the experience near language is is really rich and important. And I want to be able to to highlight and share that to contribute these other ways of describing these endlessly fascinating experiences and insights. Wonderful, thanks you. Um, I guess I am curious about, and you did kind of touch on it a little bit, even in, in the commu integration community, but what are some of the challenges you're facing from like traditional mental health or wellness industries and, and, how, and what are those challenges and how are you navigating them in your work? Uh, cautiously. <laughs> uh, yes, with a great deal of trepidation is how I'm navigating it. But um, yeah, it's, it's a minefield. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what are the things that I'm bumping up against? Um, what is referred to as psychedelic exceptionalism, mm -hmm. this idea that some drugs are better than others, that some substances are sacred and others are profane in some ways. I, I don't subscribe to that at all. You know, right tool for the right job mm. is, is my framework with that. If you find, I mean, I feel like we are constantly tinkering with our nervous systems in different ways anyway, with whatever it is, with sugar, with caffeine, with so... Uh, oh, hello, there it is, the go juice, the, you know, the cup of motivation in the morning. We're all doing that anyway. So I'm really interested, you know, it seems that some tools are perhaps a little more crude than others. Sure, but do I want to perpetuate stigma around the way people use or experiment with those substances? Absolutely not. I'm interested in what works, why and how. Yeah. Do you, maybe outside of the kind of the integration community, what are the, are you being critiqued in any way or are you in? Uh, not that I'm listening to. Oh. Uh, so I've been, uh, shall we say, flying under the radar, like quite far under the radar for some time. By design. Yeah. What I'm, by design, yes. But what I am concerned about is that there is a jostling for position in kind of different realms in these areas. And um, I'm worried that grassroots approaches, I'm worried that, you know, people who've been working in this field, you know, in the underground for 20, 30 years uh, are not gonna be heard. They're gonna drop out of the picture. I'm concerned about manualized approaches that, um, that seem very clinical also. So I just, and I wondered, you know, where are the art therapists? Where are the narrative therapists in these conversations? I'm not seeing them. They have so much to offer and contribute. Like as this movement tries to uh, legitimise its practices, it uses a, a bunch of the old strategies going, okay, what's our preferred evidence-based approach to this? Let's throw in some CBD with some entheogens and, and sorry, CBT with some entheogens and see what happens. And it's like, oh, really? Do we have to? Hmm. Yeah, you, you have me thinking about um, what I've been noticing as well is it's, you know, some of these uh, tools, or I don't, I don't know what the proper word is, but um, are being picked up by like the Silicon Valley, the yeah. te tech bros, as they're called, tech bros. Yeah, sure. Uh, and they're, you know, the biohacking community. And yeah. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that, or if, you know, it, it does seem there are people who are trying to jump on it and manualize it in some way or something. Yeah. Uh, and we know that those one size, you know, fits all approaches, uh, we know who that excludes. And it excludes the same communities over and over again. I'm worried that, you know, we're going to, we're going to replicate a, a bunch of harms. Mm. Um, yeah, in this process of legitimacy. I mean, I think that camp is very interesting. Uh, people that are interested in performance optimization. Um, using it in that way, um, sure, I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, I just want to keep seeing um, a diverse set of approaches, a nuanced set of approaches and responses. If you want to use it for, you know, stamina and um, performance enhancement, go for it. That is, that is your right. If you are more centred around... Um, personal insight or connecting with ideas of spirituality for yourself absolutely I don't think there's any 
one way. And I think we're in a really interesting time where, where we're learning so much about the different ways that these substances can be applied. But I think what's underneath all of this uh, principles that are referred to as uh, cognitive liberty, uh, the idea of autonomy over your own nervous system that I think is, is the really exciting part for this, that we're not handing over to experts anymore to go, I, I, think my, I think my disorder is a chemical imbalance. Can you, can you fix it for me? It's like, well, mm, from what I can gather, no, that it's, uh, that it's trial and error as much as anything. So why not empower yourself to conduct those trials? those trials and those errors wonderful with support with support of course yeah. um, and i understand you work primarily with 3mmc mm -hmm. i'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about 3mmc sure so one of the main reasons i've been uh, working with that one is that uh, it is not an illegal substance uh, at this time it's um, unscheduled so i'm not uh, technically breaking the law uh, by working with it, which is pretty significant mm -hmm. for me right now. Yeah. Um, and so it's a 3-methylene methylcathinone. It is in the same class of substances as uh, MDMA. Uh, same, same, but different. Uh, works on similar receptors to lots of psychedelics and um, what's the language? Empathogens, intactogens. Uh, and I've just found that, well, I have access to that expertise locally, which is amazing. There are some extraordinary chemists who are uh, very interested in, that have good motivations for developing no novel compounds. And uh, yeah, so I've been fortunate enough to focus my efforts in this area in particular. Uh, MDMA, I have quite a bit of experience with uh, recreationally um, and I just found with 3MMC shorter duration uh, efficacy it's really great and it had some slightly different qualities in that uh, it works primarily with dopamine as opposed to serotonin which does give it a different um, quality uh, I found uh, they both go under a broad umbrella of uh, to use the um, some of the more well to use the plant spirit medicine language as as a heart medicine. Mm -hmm. So a heart opening experience, a kind of deep listening that takes place, uh, but similarly also the um, dismantling of fear and self consciousness, the the suspension of that for just a little window there. Uh, is really significant and beautiful and wonderful to work with. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. I, I guess I'm wondering if you could share maybe what you're noticing, what are some of the other approaches to substance assisted therapy? What other maybe substances people are using? Mm -hmm. Oh, what aren't they using? My goodness. And particularly um, if we're talking about microdosing, which I think is a really interesting field uh, also, which I particularly love. Um, in its kind of anti-psychonaut uh, practices, you know, get higher, bigger doses, go mm, launch yourself out into the stratosphere. Like I really appreciate that people are oriented around these kind of very subtle shifts and changes. So I guess I'm kind of working more at the other end of the spectrum, like what is the smallest amount of a substance that we need for a perceptual shift to happen? And I think there's something just in that practice of really paying attention to subtle shifts like that, a kind of awareness building practice anyway, that uh, I think is really helpful and useful uh, regardless of the substance. In terms of fundamental approaches, I, I guess I can kind of split it into three. Um, psychedelic approaches, which seem to rely on this idea that you have an internal healer or internal wisdom that you're able to key into through those substances. And that is very much about the therapist, um, I guess, inhabiting more of a kind of sitter role with that. The, um, so those ideas about holding space or creating a container and then just kind of getting out the way 
letting the person go into exploring their own vast interior landscape or connecting with other realms. Uh, I don't tend to work that way. I tend to work more with an approach that's uh, loosely referred to as a psycholytic approach where I am very much engaged with the person. It's the narrative part of me. Like, I want to talk. I want to get in there. I want to ask you questions. I want to do stuff. I want to explore that relational quality. And why I've gravitated to that is because, you know, there's a kind of, I think what some people refer to as spiritual bypassing or this kind of hyper-individualism that happens sometimes with those more psychedelic approaches. What I'm hoping to see is that we're able to use these substances to, to build connection, to support community. So why not start in the room with me you're not going to travel very far when you first start working with me you're going to learn to be comfortable with yourself with your thoughts with another person in the room with a way of kind of moving or expressing or inhabiting yourself a little bit differently getting to know a different side or aspect of yourself that isn't normally there just just for a minute just to, it's just so you have a sense of what's what's possible for yourself when you are not ruled by things like fear, self-consciousness, anxiety. We can suspend them for just a minute and you can go, oh, is that me? Is that it? Like, yes, it is. It wasn't a spirit. It wasn't a plan. It wasn't, it's you. That's great. Uh, oh, and then, yes, the third, the third version of that is those kind of ceremonial or more spiritually oriented um, practices, which... Uh, I steer pretty clear of at this stage. Yeah. Do you? Mm -hmm. uh, um, is there a reason or can I ask you about that or? Yeah, cultural appropriation. Okay, yep. Yep, I, I'm, I'm sidestepping, I'm giving that a wide berth um, at the moment. I, I still have a bit to figure out there myself. Sure. I also feel like in my own um, experiments with some of the plant medicines that yeah, they do, they have their own agenda. They have a mind of their own going on. Um, I don't feel comfortable yet leading people through something uh, or into something where I've, I've no idea what's going to happen. I might come in with a plan. You might come in with a plan. Psilocybin might have a whole other plan for us. <laughs> you know, those ideas of those sorts of trickster energies or like, hmm, while I am feeling my way through, it would be helpful <laughs> if I have some sense of the parameters or the shape or the range of responses uh, to the substance. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, and you, as I understand it, integrate a lot of art in your work, and I'm wondering how do you integrate art practices in this work? Mm -hmm. So I did a little bit of training in transpersonal art therapy and kind of put that to the side uh, for a little while when I got, you know, all enamored with narrative ideas as, as you do. And then, okay, how do I start knitting these things back together? And then it kind of it was kind of obvious, really, that um, any kind of art making practice is is a giant form of externalizing so i've just sort of expanded that in this work um, in the ways that we might externalize problems in the room and i've done that by doing things like um, creating different zones in space so this kind of physical relational externalizing process we might put a hard thing in a box and walk away from it and approach and walk away from as many times as, as we need to. We might you know, create another zone that's our little cozy or safe, safe zone that we can continue to return to if things become you know, tricky in the experience. Um, yeah, art therapy actually marries so well with all of these practices, and particularly if you know, the substance is working with you in a particular way where maybe words are failing you like that's fine we don't need them we have sounds we have gestures we we have marks we can make we have objects we can move around in the room into different configurations that mean things things that feel harmonious or discordant we oh and if we're really going for it we can we can smash things we can destroy things we can create things we can 
Yeah, we can work with those impulses before we you know, funnel them down into just the right words. Wonderful. Okay, and, um, and maybe this question um, is, a, I guess a bit, I, your work is critical of like the hero's journey discourse. And I want, you know, which is part of that, maybe taking a trip, you know, and what happens on that trip. And I, I guess I'm wondering, can you say more about that? Mm -hmm. um, I guess what I'm most critical of is its dominance mm. in these realms. And, you know, as we know, when a discourse becomes so dominant and prevalent, it it leaves the door wide open for failure narratives. Mm. I'm not doing this right. I didn't have an ego death. I didn't get there. I didn't have that huge cathartic moment. I didn't get my money's worth or, or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. I didn't get the transformative silver bullet. And, you know, the problems for me in the hero's journey is that it sets up that that's, that's the best kind of journey to have. Mm. There are other journeys there are other ways to explore landscapes that are mm, less colonial sounding and again less individualized you know the hero goes you know bugger my responsibilities i'm off on my quest mm -hmm. i'm going to go and conquer these new lands and capture some piece of knowledge that's not available to anybody else and then you go oh, i've got it and then i'm going to return back and everyone's going to celebrate me as a hero with this thing that i yeah like, does it have to be that way? No, no. There are there are other ways to journey. There are you know, what happens to to delight, to play, to different kinds of exploration, to going at your own pace, to I guess more collective approaches to other people participating in what's unfolding for you. And I guess also with the hero's journey that it's centered around the conquering of fear. Some people have good reasons to be afraid and I don't want to participate in going, well, you're just not brave enough to conquer your fears right now. What about being able to kind of chip away at the edges of things? What about your right to come as close to as you can and walk away again, which you know we're actually enacting in physical space. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Um, maybe I have two questions. I'm going to combine two questions, but I guess both of them are, how do you attend to safety in this work? And maybe what is kind of pre-negotiated in the work and, and what might exclude somebody from participating in your work? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll work backwards. So I borrowed the uh, exclusion criteria from MAPS and they were very generous and, and open. And I know that a lot of the larger institutions that are research oriented, like they have a big buffer zone in place in terms of the kind of participants that they're looking for at the moment. Um, so anyone who's using any kind of medication, in particular SSRIs, is excluded. Anyone with um, any kind of heart related uh, conditions or high blood pressure is excluded. They've been um, excluding people with bipolar, which they're you know, starting to reconsider as well. Anyone that has any history of um, psychotic breaks. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty wide buffer at this point. And you know, for my own confidence and safety, I've followed that. Mm -hmm. But as I continue on through one of the important criteria for me that makes me feel safe and comfortable um, about guiding people into this is, um, oh, I don't know why I'm saying guide. I don't refer to myself as a guide, actually, um, is does the person have a history of engaging with different kinds of substances? This is where, you know, for myself, I never, think, I never thought this was a, a strength um, or, or something that would qualify someone uh, to do this kind of work. It's like, okay, if you've 
oh is swearing is the vernacular welcome in this swearing's okay here okay okay great i'm australian i find it very difficult not to i can but this is right there if you have taken a fuckload of substances in your time and you have taken them in sacred and profane context that qualifies you to have a go at this I know that you have a sense of the robustness of your own system. I know that you know how to get yourself out of trouble if things are not going great. I can help you with that. But all of these things inspire a huge amount of confidence um, in me. So I'm particularly careful with novice or naive Mm -hmm. substance users. And, you know, really do look very carefully at that broader buffer. And in working with people that way, we come back to this principle of, how about you decide what an appropriate dosage sounds like for you? Mm. You may have, you know, come to this or come to me with this idea that you're going to do this hero's dose practice and conquer all your fears. And I can see that people look absolutely terrified of that. Like it doesn't have to be that way. Would you like to start with a very small dose just so you get to kind of try it on for size? just see how you like it and then respond and let me know what you think you need next so the conversations around dosage around you know the pacing between visits you know the the time that you take to integrate to to digest and metabolize what's come up none of that's up to me I really want to be able to create space for people to go at their own pace and do what they're comfortable with. I don't know where their edges are. So all I can do is is lay out that there are as many options available to you as I can think of. What what do you want to try first? So, yeah, and one of the things that I found is really important to negotiate. um, So this came from Michael Pollan's book, Mm-hmm. This idea of radical suggestibility that in the in the peak of the experience that you are wide open to suggestion. And, you know, that jumped out for me immediately. There isn't a lot of talk about that, that window in the literature. It's like, ooh, there's a chance to exercise power in a way that's not cool, power and influence. So I thought, ooh, what am I going to do about that? How do I? I thought, ooh, duh. Um, ask them. Hey, there is going to be a point <laughs> in this experience where you are very open to suggestion. And I asked the question a few times. What is it that would be most useful to suggest to you in that moment? So I negotiate that without the influence of substances, but I also re-ask the question um, if it's possible, you know, early on in that session as well, before we hit that kind of peak. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I guess um, for our audience, can you share about how the process is structured or if somebody was going to participate in this, what might it look like? Uh, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So preparatory conversations, really important. Again, I don't determine readiness, you do. So that's as many or as few, at least a couple, um, conversations as you feel you need uh, to enter into it. And again, that might be dependent on what you decide is the appropriate dosage. I lost my train of thought there. Can you rephrase the... Yeah, just what what the structure is or how do you structure? The structure is, oh, yes, yes. So there are a few different options there. Um, What I was doing before was, yeah, a couple of preparatory conversations and then there's a main event, which uh, happens over about five hours. Mm. Um, We spend the day together, basically. Um, And I try to incorporate a community of care approach around this. So um, generally there will be a a support person that arrives and that comes in at the end of the session to kind of see what we're up to and what's happened and to escort that person home and offer to be with them um, for the afternoon as required. Some people feel like super chatty and like they want to connect. Um, so that person needs to be up for that. Or 
equally, they might just want to spend some time alone with their thoughts. So I work with that person to go, you know, please be respectful of this person's wishes and make sure that they're settled in okay. Um, and then there are uh, integration conversations that follow up. So I check in a couple of days later. Um, I ask people to make as many notes of the experience as possible. So I don't do too much in terms of um, interfering or shaping with the material um, close to the event. All we're trying to do is capture what was generated. Like we, we stirred up a bunch of stuff. Um, I understand the uh, younger people working with these substances uh, refer to 3MMC as 3M, um, like the post-it note, because they describe that the experience is like, you know, all these little fragments come up, all these little interesting you know, note to self, note to self, note to self. And I feel like, you know, my job in the process is to capture as much of that as possible because sometimes, um, particularly with bigger doses and this happens with MDMA as well, it's kind of blurry or, or dreamlike and be hard to kind of capture. So all I do is capture as much of that as possible. I ask the other person to do that. And when they go home, just write it all out. We don't have to worry about the sense making or meaning making, you know, um, to use a metaphor, perhaps we would... Uh, I think this comes from Francoise Borzat's work, actually. Uh, the needle and thread of your intention and pull that through all of those little pieces that came up and you knit that together into, into something constructive that you can incorporate into your life. Wonderful. Um, my final question for you is, um, and I ask it of everybody, but uh, what ideas or books or whatever might be capturing your attention at this moment? What, what are you excited about these days? It's a fine line between excited and overwhelmed because there's so much information out there at the moment. And I guess I'm kind of taking as much of a, uh, cross-disciplinary approach as possible, looking for the threads and connections of these different ideas and how they can feed into the work. Um, I'm a person that has, you know, like the stack of books next to the bed and read bits of different things at different times. Uh, in that stack at the moment, uh, I'm having a look at James Nestor's uh, book about breathwork. Hmm. where um, he's looked at a whole bunch of different um, disciplines and approaches to breath work. Uh, I did um, make time for some fiction, which was great um, uh, over the break. I've been reading uh, Love After the End, which is um, an anthology of two-spirit and indigiqueer speculative fiction. Really enjoying that. Hmm. And a little bit of um, a book called The Biology of Desire, uh, Mark Lewis, uh, why addiction is not a disease, and looking particularly uh, at the role that dopamine uh, plays. So this has been really helpful to refer to. Of late. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Actually, this is my last question. Uh, th those that are interested in your work and want to reach out to you, or how how do people find that, find you or find out about your work, that kind of thing. Oh, this is that, you know, hovering at the uh, under, over the radar uh, piece right now. Stay anonymous. <laughs> but you, not anymore, but yeah. I'm around. Uh, <laughs> um, I do have a website. Um, so my independent practice is Square Peg Therapy. Um, I think my website is just under my name, carmenostrander.com. People are reaching out and um, in particular, I'm starting to hear from other narrative therapists, which I'm, I'm really thrilled about um, mm. that are that perhaps are similar to me that have also come from creative backgrounds and realizing that our history of different kinds of substance use is actually really valuable uh, in these realms and talking more and more about what kind of skills and competencies uh, we bring inherently to this kind of work that we want to be able to share and develop with other people. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Well, Carmen, thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And this is, you know, I've been very curious about the work and it was wonderful. Uh, you want to have a go? You want to have a go? <laughs> 
the best experience, quite honestly. <laughs> Uh, but more more on that later but uh, <laughs> sorry but not sorry to put you on the spot there yeah <laughs> uh, but thank you very much and i know a lot i know i'm not the only one very curious about this work and so um so thank you for making the time and sharing your experience and and all of that and um yeah thanks a pleasure thanks thank you.